Hey guys, Jeremy here with KISS Aquatic Systems. K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it simple, stupid. In today's video, we're going to talk about koi spring health problems and what you can do about them. I'd argue that spring is actually by far the most dangerous time of year for your koi. In spring, your whole pond wakes up from its winter equilibrium. The fish, the bacteria, algae, aquatic plants, and unfortunately also parasites and pathogens. Now, as you might expect, different parts of your system wake up at different rates. And the unfortunate reality is that many parasites and pathogens uh, can wake up more quickly than the koi and their immune systems, which is, is a big part of what makes spring so dangerous. Now add to that all of the rapidly changing water parameters that you tend to get in the spring as well, with often violent temperature swings and, in my area, also heavy rains and winds. And uh, overall, it should come as no surprise that spring is often when problems start to pop up. So in this video, we're going to go one by one through some of the most common spring health issues for koi and how you can address them. First, let's start off with aeromonas, which are probably the number one spring issue. If your koi are getting ulcers, which are reddish sores that can grow and lead to serious internal infections, so think bloating, Popeye, pine coning, death, um, then you should definitely take note here. Now, aeromonas are a ubiquitous type of gram-negative bacteria that live in every pond and natural water system in existence. So they usually live in the shadows, feeding on fish poop and other organic matter. But if something goes wrong in your system, they can also turn around and attack and kill your fish. So what exactly causes aromonas to make the jump from mostly harmless detritivores to dangerous koi pathogens? Well, 90% of the time, aromonas infections happen uh, just because the pond is way, way too dirty. Dirty ponds have a lot more accumulated fish poop and organic matter breaking down, uh, which means they also have much higher levels of aromonas than they should, and the koi can just get overwhelmed. So the very first thing you should do if you have a serious problem with aromonas is to take a long, hard look at your mechanical filtration and make sure it's doing its job. So are you pulling water from the bottom of your pond to get at all the fish poop? Are you then moving that fish poop to conveniently located areas uh, from the bottom of your pond that can be monitored and accessed. And finally, are you doing a good enough job periodically cleaning out your mechanical filtration? So th these are the very first questions you should be asking yourself if you're seeing a pattern of aromonas infections in the spring or really any other time of year. So if all that checks out, uh, then the next thing to look for is the koi themselves are they in good condition with strong immune systems? Uh, your koi's first line of defense against aromonas and other pathogens is the slime coat. So ensuring the integrity of the slime coat is very important. So you're going to want to avoid excess handling or stress. Make sure your pond doesn't have too many rough surfaces or sharp edges that the koi can injure themselves on. And last but not least, uh, make sure you do a good job taking care of parasites. So most koi parasites 
puncture and damage the fish's slime coat, which is what allows the Aramonas to come in as a secondary infection. Okay, so taking care of the pond and the fish is the best way to prevent Aramonas infections. Now let's talk a little bit about what you can do if you already have Aramonas infections that have moved beyond a few small ulcers into something more serious. So the first thing you can do with Aramonas, uh, especially in cool spring conditions, is to heat the water or move the fish to a quarantine setup with warmer water. What this does is it accelerates the koi metabolism, an immune system, to fight off infection. You can also clean out ulcers to promote healing. I like to use a Q-tip with ultra-concentrated salt water. Uh, I know a lot of folks also like to clean wounds with hydrogen peroxide, which is also fine, but perhaps a bit harder on the fish. Now for extremely large ulcers and for internal infections, uh, the only way to really treat it is with antibiotics, which can be a bit hit or miss, to be honest. Like many other gram-negative bacteria, antibiotic resistance for Aramonas is a serious and growing problem, so I don't want to make any guarantees uh, or recommend any specific medications here, because in all likelihood it will not age well really bottom line here is the best way to deal with Aramonas is before they become a huge problem uh, by quite simply keeping the water clean and the fish in good condition. So a few small spring ulcers in healthy fish in a well-maintained koi pond are generally not a problem and will go away on their own. So in this pond here uh, we haven't had any ulcers this spring. Last year, we did get a few small ones on some of the females that got beat up pretty bad after their spawning in June, but they stayed small and healed up on their own within a few weeks. And really, they left no scars or trace of any kind. Okay, so moving on from Aramonas, let's talk about carp pox which is another extremely common issue that tends to flare up in the spring. Carp pox is a viral infection that causes waxy looking patches on the skin and fins of your koi. The lumps can be white to brownish in color and have varying thicknesses. It almost looks like someone dripped candle wax onto your koi. This disorder is caused by a type of herpes virus, and unfortunately it is uncurable. Like Aramonas, carpox often does flare up in the spring when the water is still cold, but also like Aramonas, it can stick around all year long. Uh, so overall with carpox, there's both the good news and the bad news. Good news is that your fish are probably not going to die I'd say it's more of a cosmetic infection than anything else. They may actually get better over time on their own. And most fish that get exposed to carpox will never show any visible symptoms at all. Not for the bad news. Uh, carpox, as mentioned earlier, is completely uncurable. It is a chronic long-term condition. And once carpox is brought into your pond, all of your fish will almost immediately have been exposed. Bottom line here is carpox does find its way into most koi ponds at some point, but only a few of your fish will ever show any visible signs, and those that do will likely look their worst in the spring, and then they will progressively look better and better as the season goes on. So nothing you can really do about it. Uh, except if you want, you can uh, take out the symptomatic fish from your pond, which plenty of people do. But if you are patient, uh, the symptomatic fish may get better over time. 
Uh, so in this pond, I, I've had two symptomatic fish and only two fish that have ever shown any signs of carp pox. My uh, Yamabuki Ogon, which brought it into the pond four years ago, is now pretty much completely cleared and you would never have guessed that this fish ever suffered from carp pox at this point. The other fish, unfortunately, is still symptomatic after four years. It's my uh, somewhat smaller red and black becko. Um, again, unfortunately, this fish does have some of those waxy coatings on it uh, all year round. But spring is by far the worst season, and the the coatings do tend to clear up somewhat by the summer. Uh, at this point in May, this fish is already looking a lot better than it did in March and April. So, not really the end of the world. Uh, and the rest of these fish here, many of them I've had for four plus years, have never shown any symptoms. Okay, so now that we've gone over the two most common, easily visible spring koi health issues, Let's talk about a few more issues that are not so clearly visible. So first off will be water quality. Ammonia and nitrite toxicity can be a problem for your koi pond in the spring. Even at relatively low levels, ammonia poisoning can lead to gill damage. And in more serious cases, permanent gill scarring and even death. So, symptoms usually start with flashing, though. So if you're seeing excessive flashing or jumping as the water temperature rises from its winter equilibrium, the first thing you should do is test the water for these two toxins. So the reason why these problems exist is that the nitrogen cycle, which is responsible for processing these toxic wastes, slows down and stops altogether in the winter as water temperatures fall. And as with many other things, the restart process in the spring is not always completely seamless. So the nitrifying bacteria in your pond that are responsible for eating uh, and taking out of your water the ammonia and nitrite do take some time to wake up in the spring. Whereas ammonia's toxicity is temperature dependent, and it becomes toxic immediately as water temperatures rise above winter levels. So this is why uh, in late spring, or late winter I'd say, and early spring, heat waves can occasionally cause fish kills in dirtier ponds. But even in clean, well-maintained ponds, it is possible to have temporary non-zero readings for ammonia and nitrite, in the spring, which will cause flashing and distress in your koi. So how do we limit the odds of spring ammonia and nitrite spikes in our koi ponds? Well, the best way is to keep some flow running through your biological filtration all year round, including winter. That way, the nitrifying bacteria doesn't die off in the winter and activates more quickly in the spring once the water temperatures start to rise. If you can't do that, the second best way is to take out your biological filter media at the end of pond season in the fall, gently clean it out in dechlorinated water, and then drop it into the pond itself for the winter. That way, a decent amount of the nitrifying bacteria will survive so that when you put it back in your filter in the spring, it will activate more quickly. And the third thing you can do to avoid ammonia spikes is to make sure your pond is as clean as possible at all times, which incidentally, as we discussed, will also help with air ammonas. So decaying matter uh, breaks down in your pond to release ammonia, and this happens really all times of year. So lowering the winter and spring loadings of organic matter in your pond will lower the amount of ammonia that is created in the first place. So that will definitely help, uh, especially when your filter bacteria are a bit groggy in the spring. So what this also means is that you should definitely be very careful feeding fish 
in early spring when the water is still cold. Because that also produces quite a bit of ammonia. Especially if you haven't been keeping your fish or your filter running uh, all winter. Okay, so now let's take a second, and really just only a second, to talk about those bacteria in a bottle miracle products that have popped up everywhere. So, as you can probably guess, I'm not the biggest fan in the world of purchasing bacteria for my pond. Uh, I've never done it, and I'm not sure I ever will. Uh, to be honest, I, I just don't trust that they really do anything. However, if you do choose to go that route, if your goal specifically is to kickstart the nitrogen cycle, then do make sure that you're actually buying nitrifying bacteria. So you want to specifically look for on the bottle Nitrosomonas and Nitrobacter. The reason I, I'm pointing this out is that there really are tons of different bacteria in a bottle products out there. And many of them, especially those that are marketed as sludge removers, uh, they don't actually contain nitrifying bacteria at all. They have a different kind of bacteria that breaks down organic matter. So in that case, if you're buying those, they're going to provide exactly zero help with ammonia or nitrite. And actually, if you're adding a bunch of sludge removing bacteria in the early spring, you could make matters worse because those bacteria will break down organic matter um, in your pond and actually release ammonia themselves. So anyway, uh, moving on from water quality issues, parasites can also cause flashing, jumping, and other signs of distress in our koi in the spring as they wake up and start feeding and reproducing. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into all of the different kinds of koi parasites here. But I will say quite simply that if you've had parasite issues in your pond in the past, it's a good idea to be vigilant in the spring to see if they come back while your fish are still groggy from their winter torpor. As a quick example, in this pond I have had some issues with flukes in the past, uh, which I cleared out in prior springs with prosy treatments. So, looked at the fish this year, everyone's good, there's really been no noticeable flashing or jumping, so I can check that off the box, we're all good, no need to treat this year. But it was something I was looking out for, um, and I would recommend you do the same. In the early spring, just take a good look at your fish, and uh, for some parasites in particular, it's good to catch them earlier in the season rather than later. Okay, thanks guys, that's all for now on spring koi health issues. So spring is prime time for ulcers, carp pox, and also water quality and parasite issues. So it is a good idea as pond season rolls in and your koi start coming up for food to just take a really good look at them and see if you have any problems that you need to address. Most spring health issues in clean ponds do tend to be mild and clear up on their own as the water temperatures continue to rise and the koi's immune system kicks into full gear. But sometimes our koi do need a bit of a helping hand from us. And hopefully in this video, I've done a half decent job uh, describing when and how that help might benefit them. So thanks again, guys. Hope you enjoyed the video. Take care. And as always, happy ponding.